The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the epistle of the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 15 through 28 this morning. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross." And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is He whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing unto you, our rock, our redeemer, our friend, and our savior. Give us ears, Lord, to hear, eyes to see, hearts open to receive what you have for us, bodies willing and able, Lord, to answer your call. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I don't, I don't really remember the first time I did it, but that's the way it is with things we sort of do habitually. Sometimes you don't remember the first time. But for years now, I, I've liked to just go outside at night and look up, especially on a clear night, a cooler night, when you can see the stars shaking out across the black curtain of the cosmos. I can't remember one of the first times, I guess. I, I would come home from work, and that brief season when I lived with my dad, I'd pull into the yard and, and still have my work uniform on. I'd walk into the backyard and take my cap off and just crane my neck upward and stare at the stars. I would just look at what seemed like hours. And the longer you look, I don't know if you've ever done this, and if you haven't, I implore you to do it maybe tonight or when there's a clear night outside. Just stare, and before long, more and more stars and planets and galaxies, their little twinkling lights come into view. Their light will eventually reach your eyes after traveling for millions of years. Of course, most nights, there's always one who likes to upstage the stars, one whose presence can drown out the light from a thousand far-off heavenly bodies, even, even dull a bit the galaxies in Orion's belt. That's the moon. When I was a kid, my stepbrother would tell me the moon was just E.T.'s head, only upside down. I never saw it. A friend of mine once, and I, I, I'm sure it had to be elementary school, because I'm sure no friend in college would believe this, but he told me that Fred Flintstone lived on the moon. I don't know where you get such an idea. 
I was always fond of the notion that really the moon was where Bugs Bunny and Marvin the Martian met and fought. That was really what I liked. Of course, none of those things are true. It's not true either that the moon is made of green cheese. I'm sorry to disappoint you. And there is no secret thing the government is hiding on the far side of the moon, at least as far as any of us know. The moon has been a source of speculation and imagination for centuries. And like we said this morning, just over 50 years ago yesterday, just 50 years ago yesterday, our imagination and speculation turned to wonder and awe as the first human being set foot on the lunar landscape. Captain Neil Armstrong, followed by Buzz Aldrin and poor old Michael Collins, just had to spin around the moon while they all got the glory. Right? Now, I wasn't alive then. I don't know if you know that. Uh, but I've seen the pictures of the old heavy metal cars from Detroit parked all along the highway in Florida. Thousands of people with their binoculars at least three miles away watching as that Saturn V ignited and blasted off through the atmosphere. And I've heard the stories and I've seen some of the pictures as on that night when Neil Armstrong was climbing down from the lunar module, families were gathered around those massive 13-inch console televisions to watch and then hear him say, which was actually a misquote, I don't know if you knew this, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. He was supposed to say one small step for a man. Believe it or not, that was scripted. He didn't just pull that out of the top of his head. We landed on the moon. Some of you were alive. I can only imagine what that must have been like to, to be excited, to know we did something. This one thing, this focus of our wonder and mystery became this unifying goal, and we accomplished it. Of course, there are things, still many things to learn about the moon, a great many things. We haven't come close to figuring it all out. And what's more, our trips to the moon, which we stopped making back in the 70s, have only opened up our vista of our solar system all the more. It created a deeper sense of curiosity for many people. Some who would go on to, to engineer and build satellites that would crash into the cloudy surface of Saturn right, before, right after taking pictures of its majestic rings, the Cassini satellite. We would go on to, to create a generation that would put a rover on Mars. We don't have to imagine what Mars looks like anymore. We can see pictures of it. But for many, the trip to the moon was enough. We had quenched just enough of our curiosity and wonder to move on to the next thing. The moon returned to being that great nightlight, a thing that just dulled the stars when it was full, a thing that was conquered and understood enough to not bother with it again. To touch the surface of the moon, that was enough. There was no need to dig deeper, no need to mine for anything else, no need to stretch our understanding of what, what this lunar excursion meant for opening the door to deeper understanding. There's no need. No desire to know the whole of the thing. We touched the surface, and that was enough. And I suppose, I suppose for those first Christians, touching the surface may have seemed to be enough. They didn't fully understand, couldn't fully grasp the whole of the thing themselves. The whole of this new, wonderful, frightening thing that was breaking into the world. The epistles of the New Testament are filled with words written by apostles and leaders attempting to assuage the anxiety that inevitably arises when one is chosen to follow a crucified Messiah. When one puts their trust in the divinity of a man who was lynched, who was executed, for his teachings of the true nature of love, sin, forgiveness, and grace. For his teachings on the kingdom of God. For many of those early Christians, and I suspect maybe more so for those Gentile converts, I can imagine this drastic change in their lives brought with it all kinds of mystery, all sorts of wonder, and all manner of anxiety. Of course, when those things converge, especially with anxiety, some folks tend to be a little less willing to plunge into the mystery 
and more willing to hold on to what they believe to be certain. To tighten their grip on what it is that got them to where they are without much thought given to what will carry them onward. Other folks allow the uncertainty to create within them a desire for that which seems more certain. In other words, the anxiety that can come with uncertainty, with mystery, can often lead us to make decisions that can stunt us, stunt our spiritual growth or steer us away from the path of Christ. And the audience of this letter, this, these Colossians, they serve as a clear example. We can spend a lot of time making hay on whether or not Paul wrote this or whether or not it was just to the Colossians or whether it was a circular letter, whether or not it's just a second draft of Ephesians. Scholars have filled a lot of books with that, and I'm not going to waste your time or mine with it. Because what's clear is that these people, let's call them the Colossians because that's what it says, these Colossians are struggling with this idea that Jesus was and is, in fact, the fullness of of God. It seems that there are those within the congregation there who, who believe that there needs to be something extra to go along with it. They need something more in order to, to fully experience and participate in the life of faith. The invisible, inexplicable mystery of God in Christ for them seems too intangible perhaps too easy for some of the Colossians. This can't be all there is, so, so they gravitate towards, towards what the writer, and we'll just call him Paul, says in chapter 2, verse 8, philosophy and empty deceit. Most likely the philosophy of the Socratic school and, or maybe even the influence of the early Gnostics. But furthermore, there are those who, who want to heap additions on to the faith of those at Colossae. In chapter 2, verse 16 through 19, it says, Therefore do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons or Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. There were those at Colossae who said, this fullness of God is too mysterious, too confusing. What we need are, are, are doctrines and practices and things to hold on to, to so that we can have an objective way of measuring ourselves. What seems to be happening in Colossae is that believers are struggling to place their complete faith in Christ. To trust in Jesus as the fullness of God. Not just part of God, not just an apparatus through which God creates an opportunity for salvation, but the fullness of God. Oh yeah, there's a surface level connection. They put the footprint down and planted the flag. A desire to claim Christ in order to reap the benefits that come with such a claim. But the mystery... The mystery that comes with claiming Christ as Lord only created anxiety for some of them. They needed something to do, something else to claim, some practice, some explanation, some apologetic in order to point them to, to some sense of certainty about this whole Jesus, kingdom of God thing. And so some of them clung to dogmatic practices about food and drink. Maybe it was the, the Mosaic law. Maybe it was even more than that as they were Gentiles. Maybe they made a point to observe festivals, even ones outside of the holy calendar, because, you know, it's better to hedge your bets. They even observed the Sabbath to the letter. They were attracted to practices that purposely fill them with a sense of self-righteousness. I mean, after all, if you can do something to make yourself feel better, feel more holy, well, do it. These religious sounding actions like angel worship and the proclamation of visions. Now at first, at first when I read this, I, I was ready, like I am so often when I read Paul's letters, to be on the side of Paul, right? Ready to condemn the Colossians, to wag my finger at them and say, what are you doing? You ought to know better. We may want to condemn them for such behavior, but, but the truth is, if I'm honest, if you're honest, we are just as likely, 
perhaps just as guilty as those Christians at Colossae. After all, when the invisibility and apparent silence of God only intensifies our pain or increases our anxiety, who among us hasn't thought about reaching out for something tangible? Something to give us a visible, physical place to stand. I remember back in 94 when Paul died, my maternal grandfather. Ma and Paul's house before that was just a small little brick home down in Enterprise. You'd never know it was there now. I think there's a a huddle house, a, a bank, a dialysis clinic. But back then there was nothing, just their house and a cotton field. It was a modest little house, wood paneled walls in the dining room and kitchen. Nobody really went in the living room except on Sunday when my uncle watched NASCAR. We just all sat around the table. But on those walls there weren't much, just a few pictures of family. Some weird collectible plates that my, in my memory want to say they were from Enterprise, but why would you have collectible plates from your hometown hanging on the wall? And there was this large woodcutting I wish I had that Paul brought back from his time in Korea of the Last Supper that hung over the, the doorway into the living room. But after Paul died, all of a sudden, Ma began hanging pictures of angels everywhere. And not good ones. I mean, there were little fat cherubs, tall, elegant, blonde angels with broad, bleached white wings. Stuff, you know, you pick up at Bill's dollar store. There were ghostly figures hovering over scenes of children playing and the like. On her end of the dining room table where she basically camped out, there were stacks of books about angels and angelic visions. And in the bathroom, there was always a little stool in front of the commode. You can figure out, you know, why it was there. Um, She'd keep stacks of these, what I call grocery store newsprint tabloids, like the Weekly World News. You know, you all know what I'm talking about, the ones in black and white with Bat Boy on the cover. But she would buy these every time there was some mention of an angelic vision, some clearly 90s photoshopped picture of an angel. Ma and my mom and my aunt somehow found some comfort in the idea of angels. These pictures, these ideas, biblical or not, about angelic beings that may very well be watching over them. It didn't matter if the pictures were kitschy. It didn't matter if their books were written by hacks or if the articles were clearly concocted stories published to catch the attention of anybody stuck in the express lane at Winn-Dixie. Ma used these angels to cope, to have a handhold for her grief in a world that was so suddenly different. Not too unlike a couple of years ago when my stepmother died, I went with my dad to the funeral home to make the arrangements. I know some of you have been in that place, and it's always easier after the fact to go, boy, they really ripped us off. KL's not here. Um, But... My dad, he isn't exactly a deeply religious person, but as we were sitting in the showroom, he insisted on having that image, you know the one, of those praying hands. He insisted on having those on the little funeral programs and in every detail of my stepmother's casket. Dad says he saw Paula raise her hands up just before she died, and he wanted those hands to remind him of that. When God is just a bit too invisible, when God's voice is just a bit too silent, we look for signs and we hold on to that which gives us some firm place to stand. When the anxiety is too great, we gravitate towards something even in a different time that may seem wicked and frankly foolish and stupid to us, we gravitate towards it and hold on to it because at least it's steady. At least it's there. At least I can buy a picture and hang it on the wall. At least I can have it printed on the program. At least I can have somebody support me. We're no different from those Colossians who are tempted toward the worship of angels and self-righteous humility to make themselves feel holier in the midst of uncertainty. 
to make themselves feel closer to what they believe the expectations and requirements were for the kingdom of God. Of course, when we give in to those temptations, when our anxieties and uncertainties and, and our fears, our doubts overtake us, it's often because we're too afraid to confront them. We're too afraid to wrestle with the great mystery of God in Christ. Because these other distractions are frankly easier. It's easier for the Colossians to indulge in self-righteous humility. It's easy to lose ourselves in the rigid practices of ritual. To cling to rules, laws, and dogma, believing that these things will ground us. That our faith will be made more complete by our actions in these things. Because these Colossians were holding on to these very ideas, Paul opens our text and really the whole of the epistle with words that were most likely sung as a hymn in the early church. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. And then and Paul says, for in Him, in Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Him, God was pleased to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of His cross. Right out of the gate, Paul wants these Colossians to know that while these other attractive, grounded practices and ideas do not bring one closer to God, that this life of faith in following Christ needs no supplemental help. That Christ Jesus is the fullness of God, and there's nothing else anyone needs but Jesus. Now, Paul doesn't write those words just to, to leave them hanging there so folks can pick them up and put them in their back pocket like some cheap ticket to ride. No, not at all, because he continues on. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided, Paul says, that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. In other words, Paul says Jesus is the fullness of God, reconciling the whole of creation to God's self, and that's not something to take lightly. That is not something that you just put your foot down on the surface and say, that's enough. This is why Paul says, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith. Don't try to pile on a bunch of other stuff. Don't try to look for a handhold somewhere else. Christ is the fullness of God. Trust in that. Because it will always seem easier to stray towards things that we can touch, to cling to those practices that make us feel righteous, to hold tightly to doctrines that explain things in nice little anacronyms, like my Calvinist friends and their tulips. It will always be easier to hold on to those things that, that will always be easier than to hold on to those things than to plumb the depths of the great mystery of God and the fullness found in Christ. The one who came to die, to shed his blood upon a cross in order to reconcile you and me and everyone to God and to one another. It will always be easier to want to believe that there's more to it, that we have to be more than we are, that we're not good enough. That the lies we believe about ourselves, lies that others have told about us, are true. It will always be easier to look for God in places where we are comfortable, in practices, in ideologies, in groups that make us feel safe and secure, even if those places themselves are inherently evil. It will always be easier to gaze up at the moon and simply say, we touched it. 
than to return again and again to discover new realities and even more questions. And in the same way, it will always be easier to bow our heads and say, I've got it all figured out, than to return again and again and again to the great mystery of God in Christ. To seek to know Jesus as the fullness of God. To strive to live in the way of faith that calls us to be reconciled to God and to each other. It will always be easier, but friends, we are not called to that which is easy. We are called to the life exemplified in a cross. But not just the cross of some man who died. Not just the cross of some good prophet or some good teacher. But a cross upon which the fullness of God died. So that we may live. We are called to plumb the depths of the mystery. That even when God seems invisible and distant, to know that Christ Jesus is the fullness of God. And to not shy away from what that means even in his cross, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. We are called deeper and deeper into the mystery. And God is calling you deeper and deeper into that mystery. What do you say we go? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the fullness of God, in your life, your death, and your resurrection. Help us, Lord, as we travel, as we walk on further into this life, to not shy away from the discomfort of that mystery. To, Lord, understand that with each step we take, Lord, that more unfold before us. That with each step of the journey, you continue to call us on. Lord, give us the strength, the courage to follow you. And Lord, when we reach out our hands to take hold of that which is more steady for us, forgive us. Help us to see, Lord, that there is nothing in this world, nothing in this life that sustains us apart from you. So Lord, help us to take hold of that now. May your Holy Spirit speak among us. Show us and call us deeper and deeper into the fullness of God in you. We pray these things in the holy name of Christ our Lord. Amen.